My name is Allison Arnold. I am the Agriculture Extension Agent here in Buckham County and will be your host today. I want to welcome you to Gardening in the Mountains, Terrariums, Gardens Under Glass. I'd like to welcome our speaker today, Cynthia Galuli. Cynthia is the co-owner with Molly Pritchard of Verde Design. This is a local business providing custom floral and season garden containers. Cynthia brings many years of personal and professional experience. She's a talented gardener, designer, teacher, and speaker in all things related to gardening and flower arranging. And as you will see, she has a passion and contagious enthusiasm for sharing what she knows and making it fun. So let's get going and take it away, Cynthia. Hey, we're here today to make my very favorite thing and it's terrariums. So to start off, I wanted to talk to you about the diversity of plant material as well as containers that you can choose to do this. I've made a few examples up for you guys to see. You can see right off the bat, some of them are closed containers, like this one right here, and some of them are open, which in some cases allows us to create a much bigger format than we would if we just were working within the confines of a lid. So terrariums are also great because there are so many containers that you have at your house that you could use as a, a trim that you never even thought of. So many of these containers, I found places like consignment stores, the bed, bath and beyond, the kitchen stores. This was a little candy canister. This is actually for wine. And I thought, how cute with this little lid on it, we could use it. So if you all look around, you'll probably find lots of things in your house that you could use for a terrarium, just these simple glass vases too, depending on your look and where you want it. So that being said, pick which containers you love. And then from that, I think is when you start to decide, what do I want to put in there? And the two most important things to consider are the plant material, whether it likes to be moist or not. Succulents, this is our second one right here. It's an open container purposefully because those plants cannot take the amount of moisture that is generated when you have a closed container like this one. If you look at this, you can see that this one with the lid on has created all this condensation, and that means there's plenty of moisture in the container. If you ever do a terrarium with a closed lid and you see that your container has condensation all the way around, sometimes you want to take that lid off and let a little air breathe into that container. Back to the succulents, they would do best in an open container. Small ferns and things that enjoy moisture would probably do better in a closed container. I know of instances where people have made a terrarium in a closed container and they haven't watered it for like a year. It became a perfectly contained ecosystem, which is kind of the groovy part of terrariums to begin with, that they can be like that. And then the other really important part that I would say when you're picking out your components, besides whether it's open or closed, is decide beforehand where you're going to put it because you want to pick a plant that's really suited to the environment you're putting it in. If it's a lower light environment in your home, ferns and things like that, some of the pileas, peperomias will do great. High light environment, great for the succulents. So deciding beforehand where you want to put it and then picking the correct plants for that lighting will really ensure success for you. So fun, fun, fun. Let's move on over and start talking about how we construct a terrarium. All right, so let's make a mess. So I picked this beautiful glass cylinder to start with, and I took the moss out because I wanted you to really see it from the beginning. The most important ingredient in a terrarium, actually the most essential ingredient is your charcoal. Without it, your terrarium isn't gonna be successful because a terrarium doesn't have drainage through the bottom, so there's nowhere for that water to go. And charcoal is known to be a soil sweetener. That's why you see charcoal in aquariums. It's filtering the water for the fish. You can get this at a garden center, place like that. It is always the bottom essential layer. Now I'm not gonna pour it in right yet because I wanna put this moss around the edge. Some people just use the bare soil on the outside of their containers. I don't really like that. It looks unfinished to me. So I always like to put a nice layer. This is moss that was just gathered this morning. So it's pretty darn fresh. I'm blessed enough to have some woods behind me that are full of these gorgeous mosses and I thank God every day when I get to go up and pick them. So I'm going to put this around the outer edge to give a nice green 
presentation there. And then as soon as I have that in there, I'm gonna take my most essential ingredient, the charcoal, and I'm gonna put it down a thin layer, maybe an inch, maybe two, depending on the container. And while I'm saying this, I can also say, you can see in different terrariums that you looked at earlier, sometimes I had the soil level up higher because I wanted the plants to present themselves at a certain position in the container. But for this one, I'm doing it lower because I want to have as much vision for you to see the plants behind the glass. So we put in the charcoal, and now we're gonna go ahead and put in the most important ingredient. I almost forgot. These are coffee filters. The value of them is that when you put them down in there, it creates a barrier so the soil doesn't seep into your charcoal and it, it helps the charcoal stay unsullied by soil and do a better job. So how easy, and we're gonna just stick this one down in there. It looks like it's gonna be a little too big, so I'll go ahead and cut the edges real quick. And you know, this is a great tip to do for other things too. When we're planting outside containers, when we do seminars, we always say, it's a great thing to do, to, even in a large container outside, to put the coffee filters at the bottom of the hole and it can stop bugs like slugs and other insects from getting in there during the season, which is a plus. So I'm sticking that down in there. I don't want to see it. And then I'm going to pour the soil on top. I think the quality of your potting soil does matter. Don't buy miracle Grow. Especially don't use a soil that has a fertilizer already in it because your terrarium is a contained environment and you don't really want them to grow too fast. So if you put fertilizer on it, they're going to take off so fast before you know it, your whole container is going to be out of scale and just rampant. So a successful container, of course you want it to grow. If things start getting big or out of control, that's what pruners are for. You can prune all this material back as it continues to grow and keep it in scale. Just like if you plant coleus in your garden, you know you're going to have to turn them in their containers. So the most essential ingredients in there, it's got the charcoal and now it's got the soil. And now let's play a little bit. I would say the other thing I'm constantly reminded of, especially when people are shopping for terrarium plants, you never have as much room as you think you do. And that's why terrariums are such a fun thing to do. Great for a group of friends. Tell everyone, bring a container over, pick something out from your house because you can just use little bits and pieces. Both these pieces of fern came out of one little three inch pot that I separated. It doesn't take much material at all to create a beautiful terrarium. So on this one, I'm gonna start out and I'm gonna pretend this is the back so that you guys can see it unfold. Now there's not a whole lot of room there. If you have a root ball that's big, I go ahead and tickle it and then I sort of flatten it so that it'll fit down in the amount of soil I'm requesting it to live in. Love that little fern. And once again, for this one, I'm picking plants that would do well in indirect bright light. You know, most places in your home, these plants would probably be pretty happy. So there's the fern. And I love this plant. It's kind of unusual. When I'm making a terrarium or any design, I usually try to have a focal point, a point of interest somewhere in the middle of the container, usually in the lower half of the container. So for me, this would be an automatic choice to put in there because I want your eye to go into that. I'm breaking up that root ball and tickling it apart a little bit. And I'm going to go ahead and position this. I'm actually angling it just a tiny bit and putting it into the container. But you can see in that one you saw earlier, I had a really big branch coming up. I always like to have something interesting in there. And this one is going to be an open one. So while I'm deciding what I'm going to use, I'm going to show you a couple other things that actually couldn't go in there, but I'm not sure which way we're going to go. These are actually sea fans that I collected in St. Croix over the years. And I love to put them in a container because I think they add just a special touch there and gives all that depth toward the back. And again, because this is an open one, we could do that. But also when I finish, I'm gonna show you another trick with a branch that I thought was kind of fun and novel depending on your situation. So we've got this and we've got that. Oh my gosh, it's only two plants and it's almost full. How can that be? We had such big, expectations for all the yummy things we could put in here. I really like the contrast of texture and color. This is just a little piece of a petonia, which is one of my very favorite plants. And they love terrariums. They love moisture. They come in pink and green. And once again, I'm gonna tickle that and then I'm gonna put it down in here, kind of off to the side. 
I'm just pressing it down in. So got this going on. I feel like we're going to need a little bit more excitement. Let's see what else might go. Once again, out of all the things I'm choosing, I'm making sure that I'm picking things that are going to be happy together. And I'm trying to provide a different assortment of shapes. So we've got the fern and we've got the spikiness of this and the little yumminess of this. This is another one of my favorite plants. It's a Fetonia, arrowhead plant. And I like that I'm getting all this dark texture in here. Juxtaposition of the shapes. Gosh, you guys, that's almost full. How could that be? But you know, I feel like I need something interesting to put in here. And so I'm going to go ahead and tuck some mosses over this because I don't think I'm going to put any more plants in. If I did, it might be something like a little tiny creeper. This is an exceptional plant. We've named it Teddy Bear. It's really in the Wandering Jew family. Probably has a better name than that, but we don't know it. I'm going to go ahead and tickle that in. Let's see what happens. I deliberately picked a really easy container that's easy to get my hands in. But there are going to be containers that y'all want to use that have a bottleneck and are difficult to work with. So real quick, I just want to show you there's a couple easy ways to get a tool. This is just a plastic fork that's been taped on. If you're into a container that you can't really get your hands in there or if you have particularly large hands, this is a really great way to get your soil tamped down. And it would go into a pretty narrow opening, even a bottleneck. So just stuck that in there. And you know, something I want to say about design, and I say it in every seminar I do, creativity is something that looks like a channel. It comes through us. It's not us. And some days you got it and some days you don't. And I was telling my friend Molly, my partner in Verde Design, that yesterday I just didn't have it. I made a big mistake on one over here and I'm going to bring it over and show you how badly I botched it. And then I finally said, you know what? I think it's time to call it a day. So I woke up fresh this morning and I found it was so much more flowy. So don't ever be hard on yourself. No matter if you're designing a terrarium or baking a cake, if you don't have it, walk away. Come back. The spirit will move you. That's my wisest advice. So anyway, I'm going to put a little more moss on the top. And oh, sometimes the moss can be the greatest component. Look at that with this beautiful, beautiful, we call this celadon moss. And we don't know the real name, but we love it. That to me is going to be one of the most integral pieces of this terrarium. And I'm going to go ahead and I want you to really appreciate it. So I'm going to tickle it in here to be a focal point. These guys are having a party in here already. They like it. Can you see it good at that angle? Can you see that moss yeah. in there? I sort of angled it up a tiny bit because I wanted you to appreciate it. And these mosses that were just gathered today, they can continue to grow in here, especially if they're in a closed terrarium. And sometimes the moss can even take over and you're going to have to prune it in time. Okay, while Matt's getting a close up in this, I love the variety of color because I think it adds great interest. This striped plant, it's in the wandering Jew family. I think one of the common names for it is Moses in the Cradle. This, again, is a plant in the wandering Jew family. I don't have the exact name on it, but we're calling it Teddy Bear. Max is going to zoom in on that delicious moss. It's just like velvet and the color of it is so yummy. Here to the back, we have just a little fern. Uh, this arrowhead plant is the common name and otherwise known as Nephthitis. And then the small one at the front is the Fetonia. It's also called nerve plant and it is just an excellent terrarium plant. It adores being in a terrarium. So I'm also looking at other things too to show you guys, you know, you're only limited by your imagination. So. I've got a sea fan in this one. Some of my other ones, I've put a little hornet's nest, which is one of our favorite little additions to make something special. And again, I just love the texture and the intricacy that brings your eye right into it. Some of the other ones, I use some little colored pebbles. Also, I love shells. I've got a gigantic seashell collection. And so I've even done some with just groupings of shells in there to focalize them. But even a little oriental figurine. I've got some Nitschke little figurines that my husband had before he was lucky enough to marry me. There are things, all sorts of little things that you can put in there that can be special to you. You 
a few things I've learned that do not hold up are usually bird's nests will deteriorate in time. It's a little too much moisture for them. And I've also tried some dried mushrooms, but they also will not hold up so well in a closed terrarium, but with an open one, you can probably get away with it. I showed you this because I like the way a sea fan does something, but I was playing around and I'd just gone camping with a couple of my sons a few weeks ago. My son, Elliot, found this branch. And he said, Mom, I found this branch for you. I'm like, that's really cool. I started playing around with it yesterday. And I was like, oh my goodness, look how that fits. To me, it looks like a dragon and that's his head. I thought, isn't that fun? If I had the right place in my home, let's say I was wanting to put it on a sideboard, that could be a super fun presentation and take advantage of this amazing piece of wood. I just love it. I could take it and I'd probably have to cut it down, but I could also present it coming out this way and make it really interesting, which is the why I showed you the one earlier that had a climbing vine on it. So I've, once again, as far as doing the terrariums, I say this is just the funnest thing you could ever do with plants. It takes so little material. You're only limited by your imagination. The only really essential ingredient that you can't get away without using is your charcoal. Otherwise you won't be successful. So I say it's a great opportunity to play and have fun with your plants. And I think it's a great gift for Christmas. I know my partner Molly did terrariums for all of our friends for Christmas last year and they were so appreciated. Now that you've seen the variety of containers and opportunities you have and all the fun you can have with these, get out there and look around and maybe I'll see you at a consignment store. So Allison, do we want to see if folks have any questions for us today? Yeah, absolutely. Great. Thank you, Cynthia. Yeah, somebody remarked in the chat box how epic that branch was. That's just oh. a, a beautiful, beautiful piece. So we have a couple of questions. One is about moss. If you don't have access to moss, can you buy it or how do you get it? Good question. Well, Allison, there are a few places that sell local moss, like I procured from my woods, actually BB Barnes, the garden center, where I was fortunate to work for 20 years and just retired from, they source it locally from a greenhouse and usually will have it for sale. You probably can go online and also order, we call it woodland moss from other companies, but they may not be fresh and what we consider still live. They may have gone through the drying process and so won't have the viability to continue to grow once they're in a terrarium. And there may be other local sources too, but I can only speak to knowing that we have carried it at BB Barnes from locally sourced in the area. Moss growers. Okay, great. So there's another question about using potting soil. Is it possible to use garden soil? You know, I wouldn't really recommend it, Allison. There's just too many things that can go wrong when you bring soil in from the garden. When I was a young hippie, I used to bake my soil in the oven, much to my husband's chagrin for quite a while. And it left a very distinctive aroma in our kitchen, not what he was looking for. So I'd say use a good quality potted soil. Uh, and that way you're not dealing with anything you might've brought in from the woods, insect larvae or pests or fungal or disease, anything like that. And you use so little soil. I think it's really important to start with a sterile top notch mix. And indeed, if you were making succulent or cactus gardens, I might switch from the regular potting soil mix and do something that is more suited to cacti and succulents with a, a better drainage just in case, even though later on in the program, I would say I would never do a succulent or cactus terrarium in a closed container unless I was extremely judicious about my watering as in almost never. Okay. All right. Great. So I have a question about the charcoal. So you said one inch, is that kind of a rule of thumb? It's a basic rule of thumb and that's going to vary depending on what you want to do with your terrarium. As you noted earlier, sometimes you want your soil level to be up higher to showcase your plant material, in which case I would make my layer deeper as I went on up. You can't use too much, but you could use too little. So I'd say an inch is probably the minimum and depending on how you want your terrarium level to be structured, you can add additionally. Most important is to make sure you put that coffee filter on top. Okay. Okay. There was a question about grilled charcoal and if that's usable. I believe it is not due to the processing of it and chemicals and things that might be involved. But I've been told from the get-go, do not substitute 
grilled charcoal, but it is the same quality type of charcoal that is sold in aquarium stores for the filters for that. So I believe it is a horticultural charcoal. And once again, we have traditionally sold it at BB Barnes or uh, terrariums. And I'm sure that you could also source that online. Okay, great. Yeah, I would just add, we have a big green egg that we grill on at home and we use what's called lump charcoal. That's actually a wood product. It doesn't have fillers and lighter fluid. It's not like the briquettes. I think that's what you're suggesting. You definitely don't want to use briquette charcoal that you use in another kind of grill. But anyway, safest to use the charcoal that is specific for terrariums or aquariums. But probably perfectly safe to use what you just discussed, Allison. Yeah, if it's pure wood, pure wood charcoal. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Well, let's continue on. Thank you, Cynthia. My pleasure. Now I've got an example of sometimes even the best plans can go astray. I wanted to show you this layering technique because it, it looks so fun and it's a way to introduce different materials. And I thought, oh, this is going to be easy. But actually, I spent about an hour on this and dumped it out several times and still botched it. So I'm going to see if we can troubleshoot it and fix it. And I want to explain what I did and why I did it. So I started out with these beautiful rocks, the colored rocks. I thought, oh, that'll be a lovely base. And then I realized I didn't want anything that comes above it to sully the cleanness of the rock. So I decided to get a piece of press and seal or, you know, like saran wrap. And I put that down on top of the rocks and then just went along my merry way. And then I put in my charcoal and followed the strategy. I wasn't paying attention. When I got done, I was like, oh my God, there's a huge chunk of press and seal. How unattractive. So going back to the handy tools we made, I'm going to see if I can fix this by inserting this tool in there and hiding that press and seal. And I'm jamming it down in there and trying to get the moss down in there. Ooh, I'm having slight success. So I'm just jamming it down in there and it may come to fruition that with a lot of patience, I can get this moss to stay where it is. Sometimes, in fact, let me try this. Necessity, the mother of invention. Let's see if punching that down in there well, it's helping a bit because it's very tacky to see that plastic. So I tried this in several different layers and it was going really poorly. And that's when I came up with the press and seal. So only do this when you're in a very patient mood. And once again, sometimes you have a good idea, but it doesn't come to fruition quite as easily. But that's how design is. If I had more time, I would probably obsessively do this, oh, maybe for the next half hour. I think I've made some progress, but once again, it's just an example of how you have an idea and sometimes it doesn't unfold exactly as you wished. I can't really think of another way to have done that though, because we did want to make sure we had separated the layers. What would have been perfect if there was a thin glass plate or something in there, but of course it wouldn't fit into this neck of the jar. I thought about that. It would have probably been easier, much easier with a container like the one I just showed you, the big one that was just the clear cylinder. It would have been a piece of cake. If you took a container like this, the square that's open and did the layering, that would be so easy because everything would be equal and level. While we're talking about this, this is a container gone amok, a uh, design gone astray, but Let's look at some of the other ones now and just talk about shapes and how well they worked. Coming back to this one with the little succulents in it, I love that this container is sloped. You can see it sideways with the forward presentation. I specifically didn't put moss around the edges because it's succulent and it's a more contemporary look. And it does have the little colored blue glass in it to pull out the blue, green, and the succulents. So I felt like that was harmonious. When we're doing terrariums too, we talked earlier about just all the treasures you can stick in there. And again, my dear friend Molly reminded me that it's a wonderful opportunity to walk through nature. I am graced to have some property at our house. And my favorite thing is to go up in our woods and discover all these little treasures, whether it's bird's nests. This is a turtle's 
shell that I found up there on one visit. I thought, oh, what a treasure. And I've actually put in larger containers, put something like that in there. So, so many fun treasures, the lichens and the rocks, and of course the hornet's nests, which we love so much. They're always a big deal for us to put in our containers. I talked earlier about the sea fans from St. Croix, all sorts of beautiful rocks. Going back to my shell obsession, which occurred when I moved to Sanibel Island, Florida, when I was a young girl. Watch this. What if we took those and made a little grouping of those? Like they look like little unicorn horns, don't they? Oh, you guys, that's fun. That's kind of cute. Just so, it's a great way to just showcase things you love and play around with them. But look at this one. Here's another little one. Once again, this is just, as I said, just a little tiny candy jar. We're seeing all the condensation because that one was thoroughly watered. And so when this does happen with yours and you see a lot of condensation, go ahead and lift that lid off and let it breathe a little bit. But I have a little treasure here that I've had for a long time. And I love to do something when it looks like it's a little environment. These are just some little oriental figures. Oh my gosh, they're having a meeting. There they are. They're in their little Japanese woodland. Oh, hi guys. So I just think that's adorable I and mean, it gives a whole nother sense of perspective, doesn't it? It's so fun. So you guys, this is supposed to be fun. You know, when we do these seminars, it's because we want you to get excited and feel really joyful about creating stuff and knowing that you all can do it. We've all got that inside of us. And if you do have property where you could go out and tiptoe around and find all these treasures, all these things really just came out of my woods. If you don't have property that you're able to do that, maybe you've got a friend or neighbor who would love to share that with you. And, and if you don't, make sure that if you do th see things in other locations that you would always check with the homeowner if it was not your property and make sure that it was okay. And one thing for sure, do not try to pick anything from the parkway because you can get in really big trouble. And I know because I've been stopped before way back in the day when I had my flower shop. So once again, I do have a larger terrarium over here to my left that we actually put an orchid in and it, it's a different format. It's actually stands on the ground. I grow orchids and they're my very favorite thing. So I wanted to get an orchid in here for y'all to see how lovely it looks in this container. And it is a lovely environment for an orchid too, because they enjoy that moisture. So I went ahead and I took the top jack on this one so y'all could see it better. This has a small Phalaenopsis orchid in it. And I love the elegance of the orchid in the container. A lot of times when I put a little orchid in these containers, I actually leave it in its plastic container that it was grown in and just make a space for it and insert it down in there. So when the orchid is finished blooming, I can easily lift it out without disturbing the rest of the composition and just pop another one down in there. So that works out really good. And then I was just rooting through my pantry. This is a wine decanter. And I thought I should use that before I break it. That's fun. So this is an interesting container. This is actually a bulb container. It was made to accommodate either an amaryllis bulb or paper white bulbs with water at the bottom. But I thought it would also make a really fun terrarium. And if I was going to use it as a terrarium, I would probably fill it with some lovely rocks, maybe some larger river rock like this, or you could use the pebbles. You could use whatever you wanted, something like that to give some interest. And then I would start with my charcoal and moss and whatever I was doing from there just to fill it up so it gives a nice linear presentation. And so many of these containers that we did look at earlier, they're just vases. You probably all have so many containers in your kitchen or in your pantry or your cupboards that you never even thought of as a tram. And when you get done, you're going to walk in your kitchen and go, oh my God, I could use this. I could use that. And I'm always amazed at how little material it actually takes to do a terrarium because the space you have is usually pretty intimate by the time you start putting little plants in there. Most of these have only maybe three or four plants and most of them are the little two inch miniatures. If I was gonna do this with my friends, I would just say, go shop together and pick out four or six inch pots of things you like that will separate easily. And then you can share a wealth of plants. The ferns don't really usually separate easily, but things like the phytonias, and all the trailers, all the pileas, all these things separate very easily. The creeping fig, 
And this is creeping fig and this one over here. And I'm going to pull this one over again real quick just to talk about it again. I love this branch. It's got lichens on it. And I wanted it to stay vertical like this because that's the beauty of this vine. Uh, this is another ill attempt gone astray. I used these white rocks to prop this rock into place. And it's not really doing a superior job, so I'm going to have to build it up. I didn't want my soil level to be much higher because I wanted to be able to get plants in here and have space for them to show. But at the same time, I wanted to create a more linear vertical. This is the creeping fig, and it loves to be in a terrarium, and it loves to climb. So I envision this one to continue to climb and make its own little sort of topiary just by crawling on the branches. And I probably would put some other interesting things at the bottom. Oh, talk about if you need a rock. Look what's right here. Let's do it. I'm not kidding around now. And here we are. I'm glad I have small hands. But remember, you've got your handy tools too. Well, that settled that. So there you go. And I probably well, then would still bring some moss up and put some other things at the base. Oh, what about this? This is a piece of amethyst. Oh, magic. What if I got that down in there? In fact, heck with this rock. Let's see if that'll work. So you guys, you can see, you know, I don't always know what I'm doing when I start out. I know that I want to make something beautiful and that's the most important thing. And then I just see what works. And just because you try something and it doesn't work, like when I did the layer thing, don't be discouraged. Oh, that's kind of fun. I'm liking that. And I still would probably would moss it and maybe put another plant or two beside it. And this brings us to the point again. So remember, you know, you make your composition and it looks just perfect. These things are going to grow and you're going to look at it in like a month and go, that doesn't look like when I planted it. If, if it's thriving and doing well, just take your little clippers or your little scissors and just go on down in there and go, you can't be there. And a lot of times it's something you can even make another cutting of. And in fact, because the terrarium is such a moist environment, it's a natural rooting environment too. You could make up a terrarium like this and say, maybe that's your starter terrarium, especially if it had a lid on it. And when you trimmed your other terrariums, you could put your cuttings down in there and probably just root them that way. So it'd be a incubator of sorts because it does provide all that wonderful moisture. Oh, and so now does anyone have any further questions? Thank you, Cynthia. This is just fabulous. Yeah, we've had a number of questions and I think you'll get to some of them in the remainder of our talk, but there was one question about the container with the orchid. What if you have a container with metal? Is there a problem with that corroding or becoming a problem? Another excellent question. Yes. If you don't line it, somehow you are going to go ahead and just destroy your container because it will corrode. But also, it's probably not good for the plants either to have whatever is happening in that erosion happening. So I was lucky. In that one, I actually got a clear plastic saucer that fit down perfectly on the diameter of that. So it was really easy. I only had about a few inches of depth, but that worked for what I was doing. Otherwise, I use heavy-duty plastic like you would put down for a drop cloth, a painter wood, and I cut the heavy plastic and line it that way. And usually take my glue gun and bead some glue around the, the bottom edge so it stays in place. And in a real pinch, you could actually use aluminum foil. I probably wouldn't. I'd probably prefer to use the plastic. But yeah, where there's a will, there's a way. Actually, in another one, I had a pie plate that fit down exactly into the diameter of a piece like that, a cherry piece. So if you're lucky, you might find something that's a perfect fit. But my second choice would be the plastic. Okay, great. How do you use an African violet in a terrarium? You know, I've learned from experience that an African violet actually seems to really enjoy being in a terrarium, even a closed terrarium. And that was fascinating for me because I know they don't like that they could get water spots on their leaves if they're watered incorrectly. Probably another reason why they say to water them from underneath, but they seem to do very well. And I've seen them most often in closed terrariums. So I, I want to give a shout out of yes. They seem to enjoy it. And are there plants not to use? Are there any kind of plants that you just would really caution them to be using? 
That's another excellent question. Choosing plants that stay in a more contained format is probably one of your top choices because you have so little real estate to work with that it becomes very valuable to have things that are smaller so you can get more design going on in there. First of all, you saw how tiny most of those plants were automatically the height of a plant. It would be a determining factor for when you had a really large terrarium, like a aquarium, like a 25 gallon aquarium or something like that. So yes, and plants that trail, things like wandering dew, things that have a very vigorous growth habit, you probably want to step back from because the amount of space you have to work with is so limited that you don't want aggressive plant to take over your composition quite as quickly. Excellent. Now, it seems like a lot of plants that you're choosing have a lot of beautiful foliage color and characteristics. Are there other ways to bring in flower color? Well, the flower color would probably come from things like the orchids, which are well suited that we saw in the tall standing terrarium. Again, you just mentioned the violets, little calanchos could go in there. So a cyclamen could probably go in there, although since it's a tuber, you'd have to be really careful about your watering. So yes, available flowering plants in a smaller format could be used, making sure there's compatibility with the rest of the plants there in the tray for watering as well as light. Okay. All right. And what about herbs? You know, we were just discussing that earlier, herbs. Again, Depending on the size of your terrarium, most herbs like basil have such a vigorous growth habit that it would be challenging to keep them in a terrarium format. But we mentioned thymes. The English thymes could be charming in a terrarium as long as the drainage was kept perfect, not overwatered, and excellent sunlight as most herbs would require. So probably not a top choice for an interior terrarium unless you had a right sunny garden window and enough space for the things you put in there to really flourish for a short while. Do you know if they make miniature caladiums? I've never seen a miniature caladium. I, I do so love them and all that yummy color. In They're one of the terrariums, we used a nephthitis, the common name being the arrowhead plant. And I found there are some lovely colorations on those. We use that dark burgundy one. There's a lovely chartreuse with a pink stripe and they stay can have some miniature ones. So I'm quite fond of those. And then again, looking at things like the petonias. Yeah, there are some lovely foliage plants that can help bring all that gorgeous color and texture. Great. Well, we have a couple of questions, but I think I'll save them because I think you probably will answer them in this next segment or two. So yeah, that's it for now. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Now I've really done it and created work for myself. I thought I was so clever by showing you this container. Now I've got to see if I can make it work. So how are we going to do this? I don't know. Let's try with these two handy tools I created earlier. Once again, I don't really like to see just the bare soil. So I would hope that I could get some moss around the edges because that's really my aesthetic. So I'm going to stick some in here and I'm going to take one of these little tools and see if it's going to make it easy. Well, we got it on the edge there. So I think I'll just try to get a little bit more moss around the edges with this tool. I'm taking some of that extra dirt off the edge. So we'll just keep sticking a little bit down in there. These sticks are just orchid supports that come with the Phalaenopsis orchids. I always save them because you never know when you're going to need one. And I just taped the fork and the knife on with some, it's like a thin duct tape. So this actually was a princess house wine decanter that I found up in my cupboard and I didn't even remember where it came from. So we know how long I've had that. And I like the fact that it does have this adorable little top on it. So it's going to qualify as a closed container. So here we go. We're going to stick a little bit more down in there. One of the awesome master gardeners I've met here named John, who's actually helping with this filming today told me he remembers his first terrarium project and it was very similar to this. Well, I think he said it was a five gallon jug that were so popular back in the day. And I remember doing something like that too. And there was absolutely no way you could get down in there. So he also constructed something along this line to work for him so he could do it. It gives you a lot more opportunity to work with a challenging container when you do this. 
Well, I guess I would try to trickle some soil down in here. I don't have one with me now, but if I had a minute, I'd get a funnel, just a little kitchen funnel. Oh, the charcoal is the most important thing. I got so carried away with logistics that I forgot that the charcoal is essential. Now, don't wipe your nose during this segment because you will make a mess. So this is an interesting little concoction, shall we say. But I believe because we're doing what's necessary, it will still be successful. So once again, if I had a funnel, I would probably use it and be a little tidier. You see, they've got me outside for this, don't you? There's a reason. And if you're not making a mess, you're probably not doing it right. That's what we say. So I've got it jammed down in there. It's not as perfect. This is not the one that you would try to layer with either because you would go absolutely crazy. So it doesn't have the clean lines of some of the ones where I had the opportunity to really get my hands in there. But I think as far as viability for being a good growing environment, it's going to be. I'm going to see how good I do if I take a piece and really try to get it to the edge like that. Let's see if our fork does better. See if we can twist it around a little bit and get it more to the side like that. Stay, baby, stay. I think if the moss have been wetter on this one, it might have helped too. But at any rate, let's say that we're content with this amount of moss. I think I'm going to go ahead and put a little plant in. And when I see how little space I have, it becomes almost a bit challenging to think what little plant is going to want to live in here because it's got this bottleneck. So it indicates to me right away that it needs to be a plant that does not grow very quickly, first of all, and that is not really trailly like the creeping fig because it would just look haywire in there. Probably I would take one of my favorite plants, which is the cryptanthus. These are these little star-shaped ones. It's one of my very favorite plants. It's a type of bromeliad. They come in all different colors. And here's a really pretty one here that's going to lend itself really well to being in this container. Let's see what happens when we try to tickle it down in there. Oh, I know you want to go. You're going to like it in there. Oh, look. We did it. Oh, it looks like it belongs in there. It's like a little star in there. That is sweet. I love this plant. It grows a little bit bigger, and then the magic of it is right off the top of it. Here's another one here. They grow babies on top of themselves, and so then you just lift it off, and you have another one. I adore these, and talk about loving to propagate. This is one of my very favorite plants to propagate. They're just magic. So I've got that in there. To be really honest, would I put another plant in there? I wouldn't because it's not going to be good culture for it. What I would try to do now is get some more moss. If I could find a nice wet piece, it might do better. Ooh, my favorite celadon moss. Let's put that in there. Let's see if we can get that chunky girl down in there without breaking her. I'm going to ask you to move over a little bit. So don't do this kind of terrarium if you get easily frustrated or aggravated. This one takes a little bit more dedication. Come on, baby. I just love this moss. I want it to stay in one piece. Come on, baby. There, yay, victory. We did it, guys. Cute. I like it. Like that color. It's kind of fun. And what else could we put in here? I don't think I can put anything else alive, but let's put another something from the ocean. I was fortunate enough to get to go to Hawaii a couple of years ago. And being the avid shell collector, I was right on the beach looking for stuff. Very few shells, but all this beautiful coral. So here's some pieces of coral, and I think that'll show up nicely. No, nope. the universe said no. And that one's sure not going to go down in there. So once again, my visual assessment was incorrect. But what about this adorable little cone shell? I'm just going to try. 
Aw, that worked out good. You never know what's going to happen, do you? And I could try another one. Oh, that's so cute. Maybe I can get this other one over on this side. How about that? I'm just playing it around. And so, you guys, it's just having fun. It's certainly not rocket science, and I think you're only limited by your imagination. And you could continue to do more moss and stuff. This being the cryptanthus and this being a closed container, I would probably water this extremely sparingly right off the bat now, put the lid on, and I would bet it would not be watered for months. If I saw condensation building up on here, I definitely would take this off and give it some breathing room so it doesn't rot the cryptanthus. So these tools can come in very handy when you're working with unique containers. And Allison, do we have any more questions? Absolutely. Yeah, we've had a couple of questions. Like watering the orchids, do you follow the orchid watering regime that you would normally, or how would you address that? That's another good question. No, I, I don't think you could say once a week because it is in the terrarium environment. So it does make sense to keep that small size orchid in its pot. The only way to really know is to stick your finger down in there. And if it feels moist, don't water it. If it's in the sphagnum moss, if it's in the bark, I would lift it up and actually look, hopefully it's in a clear pot and you can tell when orchids root roots are moist, they are bright green. When they are dry, they're covered with a silvery, it's called velamin and it's nature's waterproofing. So I would actually use a visual if I wasn't sure, because again, it's in a very moist environment to start with. So you would have to pay attention a little bit. And then it would also depend on the location you have it in your home and if there's available sunlight that's making it dry up quicker. So I think you'd have to live with it for a little while to get the lay of the land in terms of its watering. Okay. Probably not once a week. Okay, great. Now you talked about watering if it's a closed container. If it's an open container, then how do you gauge when you need to water that? Once again, people use these moisture meters, these gauges. That's why my nails look like this in the video, folks. Stick your finger down into the purse. Happy to feel moisture. Hold off. In a closed container, once you've done the initial watering, I oftentimes find that watering does not happen for months after that initial watering. Uh, a closed container like this, a succulent terrarium, I just checked it yesterday. It's actually at someone's home. And it's been watered twice since we've done it, extremely sparingly as succulents are not wanting very much water. So the one with the shells in it probably received no more than a fourth of a cup of water twice since it was created. Okay. So if you do overwater, how do you address that? Well, the only thing that I could say is when I've accidentally done that and realized that many times, if you have a manageable container, you can tip it sideways. And hopefully, if it's an extreme amount of additional water, it will trickle out down through the side of the container. Otherwise, I don't know really how you would. You just have to buckle up and hope that you didn't water it so much that you damaged your plant material. Let it dry out. Now, some put in a note about reindeer moss, and I just replied that it's actually a lichen, but I do see it on lists for terrariums. What's your thought about that? Oh, I love the true reindeer moss and the lichens, all those things that we find in the woods. Yes, 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 they love it. Now, there are reindeer mosses that are sold commercially. At the true reindeer moss is a very pale green, very pale, silvery, light green, but they color it when they sell it commercially. And you do not want to put that colored moss in your containers because it's extremely water soluble. And I've learned the hard way that it will make a huge mess and it can't be that great for the plants to have that artificial color in their environment. Fabulous. Great. Thanks. I'm glad I asked that. So I think we're good. We have a couple more, but let's get on with our next segment. Thank you. You're welcome. So with succulents being so popular these days and people wanting to enjoy them in their environments, we did show you one earlier that was made with succulents, but they do have their own specific watering requirements. And so we want to go ahead and do another one for you and talk about how to really be successful with the succulents when you're making your container. I'm also going to try another attempt at the layering I showed you earlier, and maybe it'll go a little better. And I'm not going to try to do as many layers this time. 
So here's just a glass cube. And once again, as we've reiterated all the way throughout the seminar, the charcoal is your most essential component because it keeps the water sweet. That's the terminology. So when the water drains into the bottom where the charcoal is located, it keeps that water from getting that stinky, smelly way that it can, and it also keeps the plant material healthy. So we know that we're going to put the charcoal in the bottom, and I'm not going to line this with moss. The succulents lend themselves to a more deserty look, I think, just by virtue of their characteristics. So I've got the charcoal in, and then I want to put sand in next because sand is going to be a layering look but I don't want the sand to go into the charcoal. So once again, I'm gonna take my coffee filters and see if I can get somewhat of approximate of a square in there so the sand won't go down. Let's see what we can do. We can do a little bit better job today. Most succulents, with the exception of a few, like the Haworthia, they really need good, bright sunlight. If you don't have that, then it's really not your best choice to make a terrarium with. Once again, location, location, location. So this is just some builder sand. And I like the color of it. It's kind of terracotta-y. So we put the charcoal down, then we put our little coffee filters. And now I'm just gonna make a layer of this sand. Back in the old days, when terrariums were really popular, I think it was the 70s, it was a super long time ago, maybe some of you can remember. There was a lot of colored sand terrariums that were made. People would just do layer after layer after layer of colored sand. It wasn't even so much about the plants. It was really just making a composition with the coloration of the sand. And that's fun too. For those of you who may not be feeling like you want to do that many plants, part of the beauty of them can be the layering technique at the base. It looks like brown sugar, doesn't it? So I've got the sand and now I don't really care about the soil. I'm probably not going to cut again, or maybe I should. Maybe if I really want to try to keep it pure, I should take another coffee filter and cut it there. And I can already see it. I'm not happy with this. I was going to try to keep you entertained and do the layering technique that I didn't do such a good job on earlier. And once again, sometimes the simplest things are really not easy at all. So. I'm doing this and it's driving me crazy that the layers aren't equal and that I'm seeing a little bit of the coffee filter. So for those of you who are wired like I am, probably don't do this one because you'll make yourself crazy. If you don't mind that freewheeling sort of look of the layers melding together, then go for it. If I was not dedicated to showing you this, I would abort mission just like I did and dump it all out and try again. But in the interest of keeping you entertained in a timely manner, we're just going to press on. I'm going to put this in here now because I'm going to put the soil in, and I don't think it's going to do the bleeding to the point that that one did. Now, as far as soil, technically and truthfully, the best soil probably would be a cacti succulent soil. You can buy it separately. It just has better drainage and not quite as much peat that is a moisture holding ingredient in soil. But once again, you control the watering and you can do a closed container with succulents, but you would probably never, ever, ever water it. The first time you made one with a closed lid and it was a succulent, you'd probably maybe spritz it just a tiny bit on the plant material the second you made it and then walk away. And you probably would not need to water it for months, months and months. So gosh, this is a great kind of plant habit to grow when you go on a lot of vacations and stuff. You know, terrariums are pretty self-sufficient and you wouldn't have to fuss with them much at all. So now we're to the third level. Oh, I'm seeing all that coffee filter, but we're just gonna do this for now. And so here we are, and now we're gonna do more succulents. Once again, we're only limited by our imagination. This one I'm gonna design to be interesting all the way around. Once again, you just have X amount of soil. You take your root ball and you tickle it apart and you kind of smash it down. It's not gonna hurt that plant at all. Press it down firmly. Go. Uh -huh. When I'm doing these, I try to keep a variety of color and texture too. This is a blue green. This is an interesting plant. It's a type of 
I believe it's a pilea. It's very obscure. I found it at BB Barnes probably about 20 years ago, and I really haven't seen it on the market since. But it's very drought tolerant, even though it may not technically be a succulent. And because of its growth abilities, even though these are just cuttings, I know that they're going to root easily in there. So I'm just going to put them in there. And once again, here's another succulent cutting. It's been calloused off. Anytime you make a cutting of a succulent, regardless whether you're doing a terrarium or any other type of repotting, you like to let it sit out where you've cut it for a couple of days, and it's called callousing off. You let the bottom of the stem dry out a little bit, and that helps to ensure that when you do pot it in soil, it's not going to rot. So here's a fun little one, and I'm just going to tuck him in over here. Most of my other components are the same blue, green. In a perfect world, I would have a different color green. I really like this one, but he's such a big boy, he would steal the show. This, by the way, is a Haworthia with a live slug on it. Yes, you little gangster slug. And I'm going to flick him off. So anyway, this is a Haworthia. I love these. It's one of the few succulents that is really low light. They have this distinctive shape and they usually have these little white spots on them or bars. You can put them in an incredibly low light and they do really well. So the name of it is Haworthia. And if you are wanting succulents in your home, do ask your garden center for that plant by name. I've seen probably eight to 10 different varieties. They are fabulous. Love them. In fact, there's a little piece that just fell off. He's gonna go in this terrarium. So here we go. I like it. I think that's plenty enough plant material. And because it is a terrarium, I'm going to finish it off with this sand because it gives sort of a southwestern flavor to it. And they're going to like this. And it's kind of fun because, again, it follows through with our layering technique. And I like the pop it gives the plants to be around that brown sugar look versus the soil. So when we finish this one, I will take a spray mist bottle and just lightly, one, two, three, four, mist those plants mainly to just get the dirt and soil off. And then I'm gonna leave it alone. And they will be happy as a clam in here and will continue to grow and thrive. One of the benefits of succulents also is that they grow much more slowly and your composition will stay as you planted it for quite a while. Which brings me to fertilizing in general, if I haven't said it. Don't fertilize your container. It doesn't need it because you're going to accelerate its growth more than you would want to in that contained environment. So they are just happy just the way they are. Now, if you've had it for like five years, you might want to give it some fertilizer or something like that. And once again, just like every creation, in time, your terrarium is going to outgrow itself. Different plants are going to grow at different rates and then just lift them out and put them back into regular pot culture. And you can always make cuttings and start over from the parent plants if you want to duplicate what you had before. I like how this turned out with the sand on top. It's kind of fun. And then once again, after we did that, we could put some fun things in there. Oh, I've got a good idea. I like this little sea fan, how that has that brownie gold sort of look to it. How about that? Adding a little bit of interest to the design. Oh, I know what I'll do. See, that's what I love about creativity. It's just ever unfolding. How about some of these? I like these. This is a brownie sort of striped rock. I think it really suits that. And just a couple to create some interest in a focal point. Here we go. So once again, as I finish this, I would go ahead and give a little tiny spray, as much to just clean the plants up, and I would call that a wrap and just let that be. And chances are you would probably not water this for months and months, depending on its lighting. So once again, Allison, do we have any questions? Yeah, we've been busy with questions. What was the name of that succulent that you just talked about that took the low light? Was that the red and green traily one? It might be the first one you put in. Oh, it's the uh, Haworthia. They look fabulous. 
and look just like a lot of the other sedums and succulents, but they are extremely low light tolerant. We make that for those yes. What's the purpose of this sand? You know, for me, I was using it just as a decorative component to create different layers. And I had put a coffee filter between each layer because I was trying to keep them segregated so they would stay nice. So in that, it was just a design element, but it would also be probably okay if I didn't put the coffee filter in between because the plants would root into that sand also, although it's an inner material. So it was used for design, but wouldn't hurt if it was a component that was layered in there just for the drainage purpose also. And okay. that's just builder sand from my house. Okay. Okay. What about play sand? Can you use play sand? I would imagine, unless it was treated with something we didn't know about, but I wouldn't think it is, or we would put it in our children's toy boxes, I hope, or sand boxes. So I probably would be just fine. I know it's a finer grade right. of sand than other sand. It should be fine. There was an interesting question about water and water plants. Have you ever worked in a terrarium where you might have a portion of it being more aquatic? That's an interesting thought and, and a delightful one. I've never made anything of that size so that I would consider putting a water feature in, but I've seen several awesome converted aquarium tanks that have incorporated all those features and all the people who have followed the terrarium concept in a large format like that and included pets like lizards and things like that, all these unusual creatures being specific to know which plants they favor and are not poisonous to them. So that's, that's a whole nother level. But as far as just putting in a water feature, you sure could, if you had the format and you could use any sort of container, like you could even use a clear glass bowl and get that down in there in your soil. It would be interesting and sounds really, really fun. So. Press on and do that, America. That's excellent. Well, there was a question about soil for succulents, and I think you answered that about getting a specific mix for cacti and succulents. I think that's generally a good idea because it drains more quickly and doesn't hold quite as much moisture. If you even had a regular potting soil mix that was a good quality and you wanted to just do it at home, you could add perlite or sand and make that a more congenial mix for cacti and succulents. Okay. Okay. Have you ever shipped a terrarium? <laughs> no, I haven't, but I'm sure it could be done. We were just thinking about that probably to, when you pack it in the box to pack it surrounded by the styrofoam peanuts. Yeah. And carefully. Yeah. Very carefully and ensure that package, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. And how long do terrariums last just about? That's another super great question. I think they can last for a long, long time. And what determines that is how astute you were in the first place about putting compatible plant material together. And then also, is it placed in the optimum light environment for the plant's requirements? So, you know, it could go for years. If you do have one that you've made the perfect decisions, you've got the right plants together and you've got the right mining. Probably the only problem you're going to have is not how long will it last, but how you're going to keep it tape and confined in its own little miniature ecosystem. There was a great practical question about watermarks on the inside of your glass. How do you keep your glass clean? I don't do a good job of that. I'm not sure that I'm exactly the one to answer besides using your Windex. You know, when you make your terrarium, that's your time. And I forgot to mention this. You could take a little paintbrush and turn it into a handy tool also and get down in there and clean the glass from your handiwork of the day. I don't know that watermarks are going to be an issue when you've created your container and you're enjoying it. It's probably more if you're finished with that container and it's not a terrarium anymore, how do you get the watermarks out? And that would be a Google, what handy remedies or products there are to remove okay. those watermarks. Okay. Okay. I appreciate everybody hanging with us. This has been so great. And I think that's it for the moment. Let's continue. So to wrap up today, I want to thank everyone for coming and being part of this extremely fun experience. And if there's anything I want to leave y'all with, it would be that this is a great opportunity to find creativity in your life to get out there in nature and prowl around and see all the amazing things that we are given to make magic with. It's one of the most 
fun experiences in gardening that I have found, and it's great to share with your friends. Grand grandchildren love to make terrariums, so get out there and I'm really enjoying it. And I just want to say again that remember that our creativity is ebb and flow like the tides, and to honor ourselves and enjoy the act of creation and that it's unique to each and every one of us. I will think of you all with my hands in the soil and wish you joy in terrariums. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Cynthia. So grateful for you. We did get a question in the chat box about buying terrariums versus making your own. And I think you've just answered that question beautifully. The fun and creativity of doing your own is just unmatched. And yeah. it's so easy. So for John and have fun.